Barry, it's good to talk to you today. As Jared said, he said, when Barry talks, we should listen, given where things moved yesterday. And you've said the intraday relief rally we saw yesterday was a bit of a head fake and that there's more downside ahead. What do you see? Well, we, we first got pretty concerned about the market in May of last year and the very low 4,000s. And uh, it looked like almost a ballistic path for the market, where it climbed the stairs and then fell out the window. Uh, you know, the market dropped very abruptly, and that's something we had been concerned about back to those levels of last uh, early summer. If the Fed does not turn more dovish, which I have no reason to expect, we have not yet seen financial conditions tighten or credit spreads widen. There's no reason for them to uh, turn dovish before the first rate hike in March. They would lose all credibility. Uh, so the Fed relentlessly moving towards tightening how much is priced into the market. The big issue that we saw was that the 10-year real yield, 10 year after inflation on the Treasury, it's called the TIPS or Treasury Inflation Protected Securities. We determined that there was a lot of convexity for the growth stocks. They were the more sensitive index to a rising real yield. And that's what we've seen year to date. Um, and so we've been watching that. We're also watching economic indicators. Some of the value trades got ahead of themselves, given that we felt inflation would pull back, that the purchasing managers index would pull back, uh, and that uh, China's stimulus would be somewhat lacking. In other words, they're doing just enough to avoid a debacle, but not a lot. Um, and uh, so overall, we, we still would wait on, uh, on the market. I think uh, the defensives are the better place to be in the next uh, couple of months of this quarter. And then we'll reassess towards the end of the quarter what the potential is for growth stocks perhaps to rebound if inflation moderates and uh, the Fed is you know, cautious to a degree about the balance sheet and the interest rate path. Uh, Barry, Jared just pointed to that 4,200 level that you're watching, the S&P 500, uh, you know, as you look to more downside, how long do you think it takes until things kind of shake itself out? Are we talking about the end of Q1? What kind of timeline? Yeah, the end of Q1 is when things become a little more clear. Um, the purchasing managers index, the PMI for manufacturing is kind of the Swiss army tool of economic indicators. It does correlate on a year-to-year -year basis with industrial production, S&P 500 earnings growth, uh, and the year-to-year S&P 500. That index uh, in the first few months of this year is going to fall out of bed from almost 60 to barely above 50. Um, also, the dollar is very important. Uh, that has a way of tightening global dollar liquidity. You translate all the mo money in the world into dollars. The dollar is strong. Global liquidity is tightening. The Chinese yuan is the currency to watch. Uh, we have been uh, seeing how strong that currency has been because of their large trade and other current account surplus. But China has an incentive, and of course, the market forces uh, them to push the currency down, which drives the dollar up. It's a disinflationary shock, not particularly great for value, eventually not great for oil prices. Ukraine's kind of in the background. It's, uh, it's very, very important for oil and gas prices. Um, I don't think Putin intends to invade, but he's got a valid point about uh, Ukraine not joining NATO ever. So um, that hasn't been resolved yet. And that's a potential real issue for the market. Uh, you could see uh, a severe winter mm -hmm. uh, on account of that. You know, Barry, even as we continue to move on forward through earnings season as well and get some of the company's forecasts, many of them pointing back to pre-pandemic levels that they're looking to see either revenues or profits grow on top of. And so with that in mind, how will investors who are hearing about some of that growth versus those pre-pandemic norms, how do you believe they'll trade on those scenarios, even with some of the headwind risk that you mentioned? Well, I mean, if Hollywood made a movie about the pandemic fiscal and monetary response, it would have to be co called Overboard Part Two. Um, you know, the, the spending at the fiscal level on COVID was just excessive. Um, $5.8 trillion, $5,800 billion were appropriated in 12 months, March of 20 to March of 21. To put that in perspective, if you inflation adjust the cost 
of World War II, plus the Marshall Plan to rebuild Europe, plus the global financial crisis fiscal response, plus the Great Recession fiscal response back in the prior decade, all of them combined was less than 5.8 trillion. And then the Fed, of course, did QE4 at a rate 45% larger than Ben Bernanke's QE3 had ever been back in 2013, and uh, had to eventually uh, soak up uh, that money on the back end. In other words, uh, reverse, overnight reverse repo became uh, 12 months of QE. So when you look at how much over-replacing income in fiscal and stimulus to drive down risk premiums drove up the market, it's a very high bar for the market mm. to exceed. And I think that's going to be a real problem uh, for earnings growth and beats versus miss rates. Uh, and you're seeing it in the market today. Well, Barry, it's great to get your insight today um, as investors try to make sense of the most recent moves. Barry Bannister, Stiefel Chief Equity Strategist.